means that I am a working mom. I'm at university. I have a part-time job. And this summer, I graduated from university, and I haven't found a job for myself yet. As a recent graduate, I feel that getting a good paying job is going to be more competitive and would be based on the skills that you have learned outside the classroom. As a young person that's just started university, COVID has made the future look very uncertain. Due to COVID, there are less job opportunities for both full-time and part-time jobs. My salary maybe changed a bit. Um, all the companies are quite insecure and unstable, so they may give out less salary than usual or the past years. Yes, I'm worried because the UN suspected 400 million job loss at the second half of 2020. COVID has definitely changed how secure I feel about my employment future. The socioeconomic impacts of this pandemic have shown the fragility of the current employment structures. I'm not sure if I'm going to have a job by the end of the year. I believe that COVID-19 has highlighted some gender-based economic problems in my community. Most women that I know who have children are considering very seriously whether it is a good idea to step back from their careers in some way. Most women are facing more unpaid work burden than men. Women in particular are affected by this the most. They're often having to leave their jobs to care for their children and be teachers, cleaners, within their own home for no pay. A very difficult and in some and at sometimes unbearable load to bear. The shifting weather patterns and climate change in my area will change. Uh, it will change for me drastically. And it does mean that our summers are getting hotter, our winters are becoming increasingly um, unstable. So it is hard to anticipate whether we are going to have um, a lot of rain, a lot of snow, anything that might impact our ability to keep our house secure and safe. As a Generation Z, I'm growing up in a time where a lot of things are now more competitive than when my parents grew up. Which is growing more expensive, food has grown more expensive, and our economy feels a little unstable. I think that the nature of work will change. The tech savvy youth will find it easier to gain access to jobs as the current trends of doing business are getting more integrated with technology. That's... And over the years, I've always advanced, I've advanced in the jobs that I've gotten. Since... So I trust that I will find, I will find a work. I am hopeful and optimistic that I will be able to find the role that I want. Hello, and welcome to What Next for the UN, a festival celebrating the 75th anniversary of the United Nations, presented by the London and Southeast region of the UN Association UK and by Peace Child International. My name is Rahul Sinha and I lead the economic security track. There are ever greater reasons for people to feel economically secure in a changing world that is confronting climate change, rapid technological development, and has historically failed to ensure prosperity was shared throughout society and, th and around the world. Today, we are bringing together experts from government, civil society, academia, and, and international organizations into three panels to discuss how we can do better by encouraging inclusion, creating growth, and ensuring resilient employment. During tonight's event, we'll be using the questions function on the right of your screen. This will allow you to ask questions of the speakers and panelists. Please check to see if your question hasn't already been asked. You can vote up a question by clicking the thumbs up icon in the bottom left of each question. Please only use the questions function to ask a question about tonight's topics. If you're having technical difficulties, please put these in the chat function where we can respond to you directly, but we won't be using it for any other purpose. To chair tonight's discussions, allow me to introduce Lord Stuart Wood of Anfield a fellow of the Blavatnik School of Government at Oxford University and the chair of the UN Association UK. Hello everyone, Rahul, thank you so much. Um, well, I won't give more context, that film gave some excellent context to the various issues we want to discuss tonight. Uh, clearly this is a time of huge volatility, huge insecurity. It's also a time, of course, when we celebrate amazing strides that we've made in the post-war period. 
this is inception of the UN. But what we want to do today is get some views from experts about causal factors, what's, what's driving change, what's driving problems and what's driving solutions. And then at the end, throw forward the question of what we need to prioritize in the next uh, 10 to 15 years in terms of policy. Now, I'm going to, my main job today is not to talk, but to keep discipline because we're going to do three huge topics in just under two hours, about 35 minutes for each of the uh, subjects. The first is going to be on inclusion, uh, how we promote inclusion in the labour market, what the barriers are, what successful interventions are to overcome those barriers. Then we're going to look at growth, how we create growth, how views have changed, now the challenges are changing uh, in developing and developed world. And then we're going to look at the question of employment, uh, the changing nature of employment and how to build resilient employment. So let me start. Uh, each, well, let me just explain how it's going to work. I'm going to ask a question of each of the panelists to lead off on, and there may be a little bit of an exchange between the panelists. But after 15 minutes, I really want to hear from you out there um, questions that you have for our panel uh, to challenge them or to ask them things beyond what they've talked about. So it'll be about 15 minutes of panel discussion and then about 20 minutes um, from you question and answer with the panel. So let me introduce our first panel, which is on inclusion, encouraging inclusion. I'm very delighted to have such a, an excellent three panels, but this panel uh, we start with, we start with Dr. Mary Kawa, who is formerly the Jordanian Minister for Planning and International Cooperation, and before that, East Africa Director for the International Labour Organization. Mary, welcome. Thank you. Pleasure, Pleasure we have you. Thank you very much. We also have Alethea Donald, an economist working at the World Bank's Gender Innovation Lab, and previously a research fellow at Harvard's Evidence for Policy Design Program. Alethea, welcome as well. Thank you so much. And we, thirdly, we have Matthew Saltmarsh, who is uh, formerly a correspondent with the New York Times, and now a representative of the UN Commission, High Commission for Refugees. Matthew, thank you for joining us. Thank you. So let me start, Mary, with you. Uh, um, uh, communities often prioritise the labour participation of some people, but not all based on individual characteristics, group identities. Taking women's work as an example, um, we see obviously more women in the labour market than we did 30 or 40 years ago, but gender equality gaps are still very wide and the unpaid care burden is still not sufficiently recognised. What do you think, what research show is behind these persistent barriers? How do they work? Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Um, Yes, today I find myself always amazed when we talk about gender equality in the world of work because the discussion feels like, look how far we have come and how far we, we have not come. Uh, and I think the reason is because uh, we see some progress, but again and again we see the same issues persisting. So, for example, uh, women are still doing a disproportionate amount of unpaid work compared to men. Women are still paid less than men. Worldwide, women earn uh, 77 cents for every dollar a man earns. Women are more likely than men to be unemployed or overrepresented in the informal economy. So the source of this in in inequality, I think, is, yes, societal norms. But these are societal norms which are entrenched in the political sphere as well as in the economic sphere, as in the economic sphere of the global, national, and local. So these societal norms are now deeply seated within policies like the macroeconomy when it comes to social protection that is sensitive to gender issues, trade and investment where the feminization of labor force in low paid export industries, uh, regulatory issues. Uh, when women don't have equal rights under the law, especially in, in issues related to their own lives, and this is an example from my region in the Arab world, education and skills policies which regenerate stereotypical gender roles. So, so this entrenchment is, is deeply rooted. However, let me add here that the higher the income of any country, the less these issues are pronounced. So when we talk about what is to be done, it is critical to talk about poverty, deviation, and poverty. 
Now, specifically, there are three issues I would like to highlight here, which I personally believe in. First, issues of care need to be tackled if further progress is to be made. You know, the double burden of working women can no longer be ignored. We need to reshape social protection policies and priorities um, and how they are formed and focus really on the care economy to provide care for women. And it's also an economy that will create jobs and decent jobs. Second, it is really undisputable that any intervention addressing women or any vulnerable group for that matter has to include a range of complementary services and sometimes regulatory measures. The only way to succeed is through an integrated approach that addresses all different forms of inequality that hinders women's economic empowerment. It could be things like transportation, it could be like a healthcare center, it could be uh, any form of service that we don't think is, is related directly to the workplace, but when it comes to women, these issues are critical. And finally, and this is what I will end in, is the importance of voice, participation, and representation. No one can assume they know better than the excluded group that you want to help. Mary, thank you. That gives us a lot to chew on to start with. I think we'll go straight to Alethea, because I think, um, Alethea, the question that I want to ask you, which leads on from that, is um, what interventions by uh, NGOs, national governments, civil society have, from your knowledge, made a difference in helping women scale these social uh, barriers uh, to labour market participation? What works um, wh when it does work and why do you think it works? Alethea. Thank you for this important question. I think we've made a lot of progress in recent decades in understanding um, kind of what policies work and what they don't. And three uh, themes I want to highlight are the power of information, the power of kind of media and positive role models, and the importance of protecting women's earnings. So on the information side, um, uh, we know that one of the main causes of women earning less than men is that they tend to concentrate in lower earning sectors. And recent research has highlighted how providing information to women on the earnings that they could be having if they kind of crossed over to male dominated sector uh, makes a big difference. We recently tested this um, with the government in the Republic of the Congo and found that the sharing this information on earnings on higher paying male dominated sector increased the likelihood of women crossing over by around eight percentage points. Another area where information is really key is in correcting misperceptions that individuals may have. Um, some research in Saudi Arabia recently found that a lot of men privately are okay with their wives working outside of the home, but they think that the vast majority of other men are not. And so they fear social sanctions from others if they allow their wife to uh, work outside the home. And simply providing accurate information and correcting these misperceptions significantly increased the proportion of women working outside of the home in Saudi Arabia because their men, their husbands allowed them to. The second is kind of the power of the media and entertainment and shaping social attitudes and promoting positive role models. Um, we've known for a while now that kind of well-produced radio and TV series can shape a range of really important outcomes but we're recently learning that even one short kind of episode or exposure can help. Um, and as an example, in, um, in the Ivory Coast, we recently piloted a 15, 20 minute video that was kind of like a soap opera featuring themes of women's inclusion. Um, and we did this in the context of a land rights um, intervention and found that after seeing even the short video, um, nearly 70% of men agreed to uh, transfer ownership of one of their land holdings to their wives. And these are women who previously had no land rights. Um, and the third is what I'll end on is kind of the importance of protecting women's earnings. Um, in a lot of contexts, women are expected to kind of hand over their earnings to their husbands, and this can obviously be demotivating, and kind of seeking out and maintaining work. Um, and there's a big literature in economics showing how kind of giving grants 
to female entrepreneurs, sometimes it has lower returns because actually the money is going to their husband's businesses and not being invested in their own. And one intervention that we recently tested um, also in the Ivory Coast in partnership with a large private agribusiness firm and the government's National Savings Bank is offering women private and blocked savings accounts that were automatically linked up um, to their earnings uh, where they worked. And we saw that uh, this increased both their effort on the job and their attendance at their job because now they, know, they knew they could retain their full earnings. And overall, this in, uh, resulted in an increase of nearly 26% in the earnings of women that actually opened uh, this kind of private and secure savings account. So these are just three themes that I'll highlight. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just very briefly, Mary, do you want to come back on any of that, seeing as it connected to what you said before I asked Matthew? No, we can we can continue with Matthew. Okay. Okay. And, and just to all of you uh, watching, please please do uh, ask us your questions. The, the question button on the right hand side of your uh, of the screen. Is there as an invitation for you all to ask our panel anything you'd like? Um, let me let me turn to Matthew. So another type of barrier, Matthew, are uh, in, intra-community barriers. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, participation by migrants, refugees, um, and asylum seekers. So how how does migration and refugee movements impact employment opportunities for migrants, and refugees, and pre-existing re residents? So should refugees be seen? as an untapped resource? And if so, how might we best leverage that? What policies work in order to do that? Matthew. Well, thank you, uh, Lord Wood and Rahul and Peace Child and UNA for inviting us to this event tonight. Um, I think the first thing I would say is, it may seem obvious, but forced displacement is increasing rapidly. In the last 10 years, the rate of forced displacement has doubled to approximately 80 million people worldwide. Uh, should uh, refugees in particular be seen as an untapped resource? I would say most certainly yes, but notwithstanding the COVID-19 situation and the potential economic contraction that might come uh, in the years ahead. What are the keys then to the integration of refugees to get them working, uh, to get them up and running? Well, there's a few. Obviously, uh, housing is one, language acquisition, um, being able to uh, embed in communities with their network, uh, be with their families, and ultimately being able to work. All of this takes time and investment. But I think the rewards are there and the re rewards come, both for the refugees themselves who want to pay back their countries that are countries of asylum, but also to the countries that have received them that ultimately can get new skills and can get uh, increased tax revenue. How good have we been at integration? Well, certainly in a European perspective, I would say not brilliant. Um, the jury is, is somewhat out. We obviously had a big influx of, of refugees around 2015 and 2016. So there's not a huge amount of evidence, but there is uh, some out there. And a, a recent study that was quite interesting by the National Integration Evaluation Mechanism found that basically most countries are sitting idle uh, I think I would net Germany out of this question because Germany has been uh, very much front and centre of this. But there are various gaps in policies, uh, lack of government and civil society partnerships, funding issues, a lack of voc vocational training, and so on. There are some central funds from government, but there aren't. Uh, they aren't particularly big. So what's tended to happen, particularly in the European context, is that interestingly, cities local authorities and civil society have started to edge into that space and say we're not necessarily getting the support that we need from local government so we're starting to form our own network to try to help help refugees and migrants along and i think that's been an interesting trend that i think will continue and has had some success on the global scale we had an interesting initiative called the global compact on refugees a couple of years ago and a big part of that was to try to get the private sector, whole of society, NGOs, international institutions and governments all working together on different projects and funding them uh, in different ways. It's started, it's underway, it's going to take time, I think um, the impetus is there and that's something that is really positive. 
Um, I won't go into the question of housing and education for time, but just in terms of work and, and refugees working in the West in particular, the numbers aren't great at the moment. Um, there's been a study of the UK and Netherlands of, of Syrian refugees that finds that about 80% of them are not working at the moment. So much more can be done. But as I said earlier, it's, it's a long-term process. It takes maybe five or six years to get a 50% participation rate uh, and much longer to get fuller employment rates. What are the main barriers? Obviously, the, one of the main barriers is language, language acquisition, uh, administration and bureaucracy, uh, recognition of qualifications is still a big issue. You can get refugees who come over with, for example, an engineering degree from, from their home country that's not recognized in their country of asylum. And also a lack of uh, employer awareness that they are able to and allowed in most cases to employ refugees um, and then maybe matching services. So, so bodies that can actually bring refugees together with potential employers, because we know that particularly in the current environment, a lot of com companies do want to do uh, positive things that are seen as sustainable and that, that help society rather than just be give, uh, driven by profit. So I think there's a lot more work that can be done on the educational side um with businesses and we have some positive examples in europe some big companies ikea starbucks um grant thornton the nhs in the uk all have had programs to bring refugees along but it is an intensive process and you need a really specific skill set to uh, bridge that divide between arrival and employment and that's something that takes time and investment just a final word then maybe on Solutions, I talked about funding. I think the solution is increasingly local and vocational. And there's some interesting financial products that have emerged on the market in recent years, particularly social impact bonds. We've seen a few of those in this space and some companies have embraced those. Uh, just a very final word on COVID. It's obviously had a very big impact in this space, but it's also been positive in the sense that I think in Western countries in particular, um, a lot of refugees have stepped forward as key workers. We've seen them as nurses and in some cases as doctors and so on. And that's presented a really good role model. And it's allowed people to say, look, there are people with skills who want to do well and who want to integrate. And they're willing to do the toughest jobs out there, often for not great pay. And I think that that's something to be quite positive on if we can take that forward. That's fascinating, Matthew. Can I just ask a quick follow up? I guess one issue is particularly in, in, in Europe, but elsewhere in, in the more sort of advanced industrial economies, that, um, that a combination of explicit prohibitions on, for example, asylum seekers being able to work, combined with um, welfare states with benefit rules that require prior contributions before you can access them. These rules tend to funnel um, migrants and asylum seekers into informal labour markets, right? Black economy and those. Is that a common problem? Is that something that, that has been successfully addressed um, by some countries rather than others? I think there's a, a mixed picture there. Certainly some countries do not allow asylum seekers to work. A couple of examples would be the UK and France. And there you see that the integration of refugees is delayed uh, for quite a long period. Other countries have been more open and more progressive. Sweden, for example, and studies there show that the integration outcomes are much more beneficial um you know if, if you're an asylum seeker and you're sent to a dispersal area in subpar uh, accommodation and you have no prospect of earning any money you're already in a very difficult position psychologically socially and in terms of moving ahead with that vocational training so i think yes that's something we would certainly advocate for uh, across the board Great, thank you very much. We've got a couple of questions uh, coming in, so let me let me fire them off to you. Um, so Amy, Amy asked a question, I guess mostly aimed at Alethea and, and, and Mary, about informal care uh, and work in the home, like childcare, domestic work. Um, she asked how it can be taken, how it's taken account in terms of economic policy. In other words, what, I guess are there ways of trying to promote it and reward it properly, which have been successful? Uh, what's the, what's the latest? Or what, 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 what more attractive ways are there of, of using economic policy to stimulate and recognize that kind of informal sector work? Shall I try? Yeah. <laughs> right. 
Okay. Okay. So I will take, I will be talking more about the global south and maybe the countries I know, which is uh, Middle East and uh, um, also East Africa. I think the most important thing or incentive for someone to transit, transition to the formal economy would be um, the social protection system. And if they think of, if they need um, education subsidies, uh, healthcare, future pensions, and once the social protection systems in the country are no longer um, closed and they provide incentives for very limited contributions, then you are encouraging a person in the informal economy to participate. Another thing I think is lifelong learning and skills. As long as your skill remains low, uh, as long as your market access is limited, uh, there is you will have no option to enter the formal economy or grow. So there's a lot of opportunities uh, about uh, what they saw a uh, recognition of prior learning. For example, if you have a, a skill like uh, um, a carpenter or something, and you get certified, but but the certification process is very easy for you because you have all this experience, then suddenly you can have access to all these formal sector contracts. So, so the first is social protection, and the second is skills, and the third is actually uh, knowledge, uh, knowledge about where are the opportunities, um, because I feel especially women who work from home don't have the opportunities to, to know what is going and to grow their businesses. And in this, there's a lot of good ex examples around the world in terms of group formation, where um, a group of women might form a small value chain, uh, each, of, each of them producing something, and then they can have a uh, saving schemes, and then the saving schemes will lead them to having um, being covered in the social protection mechanisms, and so on and so forth. I hope I answered the question. Thank you. Alethea, anything you want to add on, on this subject? Yeah, I think, I mean, we need to tackle the problem of unpaid care work from several angles. The first is I think there's still room on reforming laws and regulations. The World Bank's Women Business and the Law put out their report this year, kind of reviewing where we still have gaps in laws. And parenthood was the number one area uh, where we still have work to do. And about half of the economies measured uh, did not have good practices um, on this topic, either because of insufficient maternity leave or no paternity leave or a combination of the two uh, or no protections for pregnant women. Um, so this is still an area where um, you know, there's, there's a lot to do on the formal side. But beyond that, I think, um, engaging men and kind of being equal partners in homework, uh, both in taking care of children, but also in domestic chores. In several studies that we did, we found that while taking care of children is a huge constraint on women's labor force participation and productivity, um, domestic chores and kind of the inflexibility of having to be around, you know, three times a day to cook meals and provide uh, prevents women from taking advantage of job opportunities, skill building opportunities, um, or even dedicating labor um, to their jobs at critical times. For example, in agriculture, sometimes women harvest lower quality crops because they get around to harvest later <laughs> because their time is the one that's always claimed first in the, in the house. Thank you very much, Althea. It's fascinating. Uh, another question from uh, Katia, which is an interesting connection, I think, to this topic is uh, Katia asks what, what you all think of a universal basic income. And I guess that I guess that that's often mooted in response to the idea of technology taking jobs away. But there's an interesting question about whether with your expertise from the migrants' point of view, from gender participation point of view, would universal basic income have a positive effect, um, or would it be neither here nor there? What's your what's your what's your sense of it? Do you want me to start? Sure, I'll ask Mary, then maybe ask Matt. Okay. Um, I I think that uh, universal 
uh, universal income, uh, basic income is uh, at today in the post-COVID world a very important thing to consider. It's a program where every citizen receives a flat monthly payment, regardless of whether they're working and earning an income or not. Uh, and this targets people living below poverty. So, so the money invested in making sure that people do have some kind of social safety net is is today is maybe much cheaper than the huge investments that are now needed to bail out entire economies, you know. It also contributes to promoting equality and inclusion in a structural manner. So some may say it's very costly, and perhaps it is, but others, other measures which do not guarantee an equal level playing field is also costly. Um, and I do think that this is an area um, for international cooperation and where the United Nations can play a very instrumental role in supporting this concept in this post-COVID period where we know that uh, poverty has increased dramatically. I think, just to, yeah, just to come in, I mean, institutionally, we, we wouldn't have a position economically on that. But I think we would feel, obviously, that everyone has the right to live in dignity. And when you are at the bottom of the rung in terms of any benefits you can have and the life that you live, um, then there is an argument for, for more equality there. Um, as you mentioned, uh, Stuart, you know, a lot of uh, refugees and asylum seekers and migrants as well are really in quite precarious economic positions in terms of their employment. Uh, the gig economy is very common, jobbing from place to place. Uh, and, and that really, going back to the earlier remarks, makes it that much harder for them to integrate and to stand on their own feet and to become, quote unquote, productive members of society who can give back. So I think there is a strong case, whether it's through universal basic income or benefits, um, for there to be a really important level of support in the early years until they can establish it themselves and, and then be able to give them. Thank you. We have another question here, specifically for you, actually, Matthew, from uh, David Wardrop, who's uh, from the UNA in Westminster. Hello to David. Um, David reminds us that in 1920, a million refugees in Europe led the League of Nations to appoint Nansen as High Commissioner, creating famously Nansen passports that allowed refugees to work. Why in today's politics do we find leaders less welcoming of refugees? Is there a, is there a collective failure to do something similar at the moment? What do you think, Matthew? Well, um, we're living in a very complicated world at the moment, a multipolar world. In some ways, the Cold War gave a certain amount of certainty. Uh, there were more or less two sides and uh, when there was a conflict and it was resolved, uh, oftentimes uh, refugees could return home and, and they did so in great numbers, particularly in the 1990s in, in Africa. Um, now we're seeing in the current world um, much more of a disparate landscape. Um, if you look at Africa, for example, which is the largest producer of refugees in the world, you're seeing a, a multitude of complex uh, conflicts that could be around resources, they could be around religion, they could be around government. Um, and the Sahel is the most recent example that we've been raising the alarm on, uh, where you've seen massive, massive displacement in a, in a country like Burkina Faso. So, you know, as an international community, we have the UN institutions, but governments aren't internationally addressing the root causes of why people are fleeing, whether that's within countries or across borders. And I think if you add to that, uh, we have seen the rise of populism, of, of more authoritarian regimes, and many of those regimes are, are not welcoming of refugees, and they take the view for political expediency uh, that, that foreigners are not welcome. Um, and that plays out among, among the population, and those kind of messages stick with people. Um, and then the public slowly start to become more hostile and xenophobia starts to become entrenched. And it's a much, much harder job then to create a more welcoming culture, even though I would say what is quite encouraging, using the UK as an example, 
is that civil society has been massively mobilized to help support. So notwithstanding the, the uh, complexion of the government, you do have uh, a really strong grassroots uh, community that supports refugees. So that I think is, is more encouraging. Thank you. We've got, got time for a couple more quick questions. Um, Alethea, maybe this one's for you um, from Victoria, who asks specifically how what you recommend for the media's role, what the media's role should be in promoting the participation of women in the workplace uh, in society. Are there specific things that we could look to the media to do that we aren't doing at the moment? I know you touched on your fascinating talk on transparency and issues like that. Specifically on the media, what would you recommend? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So the things that we found to be really effective, for example, in the video interventions that I was talking about before, is really highlighting the benefits of women's economic inclusion, both as a right, but also um, for the entire family and household, right? We have evidence that giving women, you know, land rights um, or allowing women to have a say um, over their earnings can benefit children in the household, uh, can increase the income um, of, of communities. And so I think one thing that we found to be really effective is um, making that case and just highlighting, weaving in an entertaining way. I think that's really the key. <laughs> I think people don't like being talked to and don't like being lectured to, but kind of weaving messages of the dignity of women, but also the benefits, the economic and social benefits of women's inclusion in storylines that are kind of entertaining and compelling and that people can kind of see themselves in um, is really effective. And that's why in the literature, you know, soap, opera, soap operas, telenovelas have been one of the main like agents for change <laughs> in this area. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask the panel in a second to, to come up with just in 30 seconds or 60 seconds, one or two recommendations, policy recommendations, which they would want to prioritize for the next uh, for the next five to ten years. But one last question from the audience, a really smart question from Tamara, which is, and this is really for any of you who want to just briefly answer this. Tamara says, one of the outcomes of COVID was in, has been increased widespread use of virtual technologies that have opened access to learning, communication and certification that may not have been as, as accessible in the past. Can these technologies be leveraged to create opportunities for those who've been excluded more in the future? Does anyone want to have a go at that? It's a very good question. You see, it's such a good question. It stumped us all. I know. I, I can have a very quick go from a sort of refugee perspective. Uh, the, the answer is, is undoubtedly yes. Although, uh, you know, refugees have to a certain extent been using uh, technology in their networks and, and, and movements for, for some time now. I mean, there are various programs in particularly in Africa that are trying to bring um, distance learning and using uh, mobile technology and networks into refugee camps. Um, and that's been really positive. And that predated COVID. Uh, one of the problems you have there is is accessibility to national networks. So you need big infrastructure from countries themselves to put in the um, the masks and the hardware to allow you know the signals to get through to places that are are quite remote, which is where a, a large number of refugees are hosted. Thank you very much, Matthew. So just in closing, I'm going to ask each of you to do an impossible thing, which is to prioritise one or two recommendations distilled from your knowledge and your talks uh, that we can carry with us uh, as we as we go as we go away from this today. Mary, let's start with you. What, what would you want to leave us with in terms of looking forward to things that we should be focusing on? Uh, for me, I see the whole area of uh, social protection in the big uh, in the big sense of the social of social protection, whether for those who are working or for, or for vulnerable groups outside the labor market and the whole area of taking a person from childhood uh, to old age and be protected by uh, healthcare, schooling, uh, access to work and pensions. 
I do not think a lot of people today in, uh, in many countries have a proper pension. They might have worked 30 years and then they find themselves uh, with the economic and w conditions and inflation that it's, they cannot survive with this pension. So I would say social protection is the big area to look at for uh, more equitable societies. Thank you, and a life cycle view of social protection from what you've been saying, absolutely. Alethea, how about, how about... I think there's many priorities, right? Redistributing unpaid work and care, strengthening women's voice and representation, tackling adverse social norms, but kind of undergirding all of this, and this is the key one, I think, is we need more evidence-based policy making. Um, and effective decision making relies on timely and high quality data. Too often we still have too little data. We don't have gender disaggregated data. Um, and often we um, don't have data on the outcomes that actually matter. Um, so, right, we care about labor force participation because it's a proxy for women's agency and women's well being. Um, but I think, you know, we're in the 21st century and we can start, you know, measuring the final outcomes we care about, like agency and well being, directly and really focus on measuring what matters. Excellent. Thank you very much. And lastly, Matthew, what, what from your point of view? I would say that, you know, don't feel disenfranchised at the individual or local level. Um, there are things you can do. And as I mentioned in the introductory remarks, there are lots of initiatives and groups coming together that, that can help the situation, even if you feel that your government is perhaps not doing as much as you would like to see. Um, I would also say um, try and mobilize the private sector from within uh, your company or with like-minded people, there's lots more that can be done through mobilizing private capital to support integration and to support refugees. And finally, going a little bit perhaps off piece, but I would say don't take the Refugee Convention for granted. Uh, it's a really keystone document that has saved millions of lives. And if it goes, it may not come back in its current form. So um, I think that's very important to consider at the political level as well. Thank you. Wise words about the, the fragility of international conventions and the need to nurture them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary, Alethea, Matthew, for your time, for packing so much into such a short space of time. We're really, really grateful. And we'll all give you a virtual round of applause. Um, but what we're going to do now is, is shuffle to a second panel. And Damien, who's doing amazing technical logistics behind the scenes, is going to hopefully put our new panel up. Now, our panel, uh, this is going to be on creating growth, how to create growth. And we have four participants, so grace the discipline, even the first panel is going to be required. Let me just briefly introduce everyone. Uh, Dame Barbara Stocking, we're delighted to have with us, president of Murray Edwards College, Cambridge University, and formerly the chief executive of Oxfam. Hello, Barbara. We hope she's there. She's coming soon if she's not. Um, we have Jeremy Lafroy with us, founder of Equity for Africa and formerly a member of parliament in the UK for Stafford. Hello, Jeremy. Hi, Stuart. We have Tim Jones. Timothy Jones is Director of Policy at the Jubilee Debt Campaign. Hello, Tim. Hi, Stuart. Hi. And we have, hopefully, Adriana Pollier, who's Executive Director of one of our co-sponsors, our partners, Peace Child International. Hello, Adriana. Hi. Barbara, can you hear us? Are you with us? I can certainly do that. Can you see me now? Hello, Barbara. Let's start with you, if you don't mind, because I think we want to kick off here by... Um, talking about something you know a lot about, which is the issues in getting financial security uh, in low in economics in low income countries. How do we go about doing that? Well, well topic for you to get into. Uh, I wanted to, to start by saying a bit more about what the issues are in, in low income countries at the moment, because one of the biggest issues is about the growth of the youth population. Now, that sounds a bit odd to worry about it because youth is full of energy, you know, ideas, etc. But the, the demography of low-income countries has changed dramatically and is nothing like what we you know, experience in the West with our ageing population. Um, you know, for example, in Uganda, 65% of the population is under 25. Um, and where does that lead us in terms of jobs coming back to our economic security uh, questions? And, of course, that is an enormous challenge. And even the World Bank says probably only 400 million jobs could be created in the next 10 years. A billion need jobs. So what happens to the other 600 million? 
So this is a really serious question about what to do. And it is quite clear that it's very unlikely that everybody will have what we in the West would call a job in a, a you know, sort of any sort of long term sense. And talking to a lot of young people, which is what we've been doing in some research out of Cambridge uh, in developing in, in low income countries, is what they say is how, how do they survive now? And they use the term all the time. We get by. And what getting by means is that they have a lot of different jobs. Some of those in the previous panel described this a bit, you know, that you have in jobs in the informal sector, sometimes a job in the formal sector, sometimes paid, sometimes not. And you add it up just enough to make a living, really. Now, um, in many ways, of course, that isn't very satisfactory. But at the moment, we still have no really good understanding of how we create jobs well in those countries. Um, I mean, the World Bank has put a lot of money into um, entrepreneurial skills and microfinance, obviously, for, you know, to try and create jobs. And although well, what the evidence shows from that is it's not bad for the people involved and certainly some of them who've got entrepreneurial skills, but it doesn't solve this problem, really, because the numbers of jobs created is, is very, very small. It's just, you know, if, even if you're lucky, it's one or two jobs. It's not it's not really getting there. So we have to figure out how to how we're going to work to get new jobs, but at the same time, make sure we don't do anything in policy that really actually knocks you know, all those young people back any further. And interestingly, that one of the issues that's come up that was in the previous panel discussion was about the informal sector. Because, um, of course, people like me have gone around for ages thinking that we've got to get people out of the informal sector. Of course, because we want them in decent work. Of course, because we want them to pay taxes. Um, but, so you can have good social services in countries. But frankly, if you try to do that now in the low income countries, you will really knock a whole load of young people really off, off the track entirely. Um, the, other, the other issue is about, well, should we just do the universal basic income that's been talked about? And there's no doubt at all that you need social protection. That's absolutely clear. But again, what the young people have said to us in the surveys we're doing, it's that it doesn't answer the question. We don't just want to get enough money to survive. What we want to do is we want to have meaning in our lives. We want to contribute to the community. We want to be seen as somebody having status. And actually work generally is the thing that actually gives you that positioning, really. So I think we've got to think pretty hard about you know, how we can, in a way, juggle our way out of it. But um, maybe the thing I should say to sort of you know, complete this sort of first bit in is that um, the answer, I think, has to be a lot with the young people themselves. Now, it doesn't mean to say that there aren't skills and, um, uh, and research and knowledge and resources that can actually help young people and governments for them sort this all out. Um, but if you don't ask the young people about their lives and how they're living, then you're going to come up with the wrong answers. Also, um, I don't think, well, certainly people my age have no idea what these new jobs are going to be. But it's those young people who are going to create them, actually. So it's about listening to them and working alongside them if we're going to really you know, get to some solution for this. Um, but it is, I think, just to conclude, it is a really serious challenge to us because, of course, what we really don't want is a waste you know, of all that energy of young people. But, of course, um, what, we, what you will do is increase migration um, uh, you know, considerably, actually, and also the, the, the issues around conflict. Because we already know from you know, some of the research in previous times that particularly young men who don't have a purpose in life, uh, it's very easy to recruit them into all sorts of conflicts, really. So a big job to be done, but I wouldn't be negative. I think those young people out there have got it and can get us there. Lovely. Thank you, Barbara. Excellent overview of the, of the issues and the challenges and the distinction between income and meaningful employment, I think, is exactly a, a huge issue for, for all of us in this area. Let me let me go to Jeremy now. Jeremy, you may want to pick up some things that Barbara um, talked about, but I guess the question I want to ask you is what do we know about what's worked in the past in developing lab mature labour markets and stimulating employment growth? What does the evidence suggest? Where, where should we be looking and what should we be Well, th thanks very much, Stuart, and, and thanks to Barbara. And she and her team at Murray Edwards have produced a very, very good book booklet on this, which I recommend people to read. I think you have to look at what's worked by perhaps looking around at our own communities, wherever we are, 
And one of the uh, things that I think we've noticed, I noticed this in my own area of Staffordshire, what is the largest employer in the area? And the largest employer is in fact the health service. And it's our local hospital employing about 8,000 people. I, last weekend, I happened to be in Kenya on work and I was down in Kisi because we're talking about a partnership between the referral hospital in Kisi and uh, the hospital in Stoke and uh, the University and Medical School at Keele and, and Staffordshire. And there again, the biggest employer was in the town was the hospital as far as I could see. And if we look at the second biggest employer, if you take them all together, it's probably the schools and other educational institutions. And I think one of the problems, and I, I speak as somebody who's spent most of my life in the private sector, is we look at jobs and we think, well, of course, the private sector is really the only place that creates a lot of jobs. And it's true, it does create uh, most of the jobs. But we also we ignore where a lot of the good jobs are to be created and where they're not at the moment. So, for instance, if you look at the number of health workers uh, in developing countries per head of population, it's far, far below even in middle income countries. So there's a great opportunity there to train far more health workers at all levels, far more teachers at all levels, far more uh, college lecturers at all levels. And they are very good and meaningful jobs that are absolutely vital for the development of a country. So I think sometimes we, we tend to ignore what's staring us in the face, that there are many, many jobs to be created in those areas which are vital for our social well-being. But if I turn to the private sector, and um, what I've been involved in for a number of years is trying to get a finance to small and medium enterprises in developing countries, and particularly uh, in, in, in agriculture, but not exclusively the case. And, and what we find is the existing financial institutions, uh, the banks are not really able or willing to lend at that level. Microfinance has done an absolutely fantastic job at the lowest level, at the smallest level, uh, but it is not tackling where most of the jobs are going to be created, which is in small and, and medium industries. And that's why we've come up. There, there are many ways that you can tackle this. We, we happen to do it through leasing because leasing is a, a way in which you can provide the, the productive assets that uh, young people, small and medium enterprises need in order to create other jobs to improve their productivity and so on. But there are many, many other ways. Um, what else? I, I, I think the ease of doing business, having worked and lived in, in Tanzania for many years, it wasn't easy to do business there. And it wasn't the environment or the people. They were all very willing uh, to work and do the business. The problem was the business environment was not conducive. The tax systems, the regulations and so on. I'm, I'm not against regulation. It's vital. But it's got to be smart regulation. And if you look at the economies of Asia, that have done very well. Yes, they have regulation. They have uh, very good regulation, but it doesn't obstruct uh, the creation of business and creation of jobs. And then, of course, there's the question of infrastructure. And I was, I was, very, I've, I've noticed a huge improvement in infrastructure uh, in many countries, which enables, uh, if you look at things like broadband and mobile networks, enables young people to get involved in, in digital technology in the way uh, that wouldn't have happened. 10 or 20 years ago. I'll just close with a final example where I met a young um, entrepreneur in Uganda uh, three or four years ago called Ronald, who has set up an excellent business in developing apps for smallholder farmers, monitoring the health and well-being of their, their livestock. But not only was he doing this, he was helping lots of other young people with their own businesses. So he wasn't just trying to create his own. He was working together in a community to create those jobs and as Barbara said a lot of the solutions most of the solutions lie with the the inventiveness and the cooperation of the entrepreneurial nature of the young people themselves. Thank you very much Jeremy you both both Barbara and Jeremy raised the question of all the, the challenge of uh, the growth in jobs is going to come precisely in the SME sector that governments find it most difficult to to stimulate and, uh, and and predict the traje trajectory of. And I want to turn to Adriana Pollier now, who's, uh, who's more expertise on the informal sector. So Adriana, we've already talked about informal care in the first panel. Um, how can NGOs and civil society help support informal businesses to grow and create economic opportunity, particularly for the world's poorest? 
Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating challenge and it's something that's very close to my heart and everyone um, here at Peace Child. Um, we really work hard in this area to support people in the informal economy to grow their businesses. Um, you know, the informal economy is um, actually recognised as one of the largest workforces. Uh, the ILO actually released some statistics um, in 2018, I believe, saying that it was 61% of the world's workers earn their income actually in the informal economy. So that represents about 2, million, um, 2 billion people. Um, so it's a really significant area and something which can't be overlooked. I think, you know, when you're talking about the growth potential and how you, I mean, as Barbara touched on, how you take people from the informal economy into the formal economy is a whole challenge in itself. But how do we support people in the informal economy to gain access to, you know, more social protection and to um, opportunities to help them to grow those businesses so that they can create more jobs um, and they can employ more people? One of the areas that we look at quite a lot is um, the education side of it. So, you know, even if you've got people in the informal economy who have had an education of some level, often that education hasn't set them up to be an entrepreneur. So they know very little about business skills and how to actually grow those businesses into something um, larger. So really, we, we spend a lot of time looking at how to um, work with them. Um, and some of these um, women that we work with have never had any form of education. So we're talking about people who might be illiterate. And one of you know, the two key challenges are delivering those business skills, but also how they can access finance, which um, Jeremy obviously touched on. And the um, access to finance is very hard because one, they don't have the collateral, um, but also they're, they're the majority of their finance comes from the informal savings groups. So um, it's really about providing support and structure around these businesses so that they can actually um, grow and become more, more um, employers um, and take on more people. I mean, I think it's a very interesting challenge in itself in terms of job creation, because how do you measure that job creation? Because often people working in the informal economy in particular um, as um, I think it was Barbara was saying, um, have more than one job. They have multiple jobs. So when you create a job, what is a job? Is it a certain amount of hours? Is it a certain level of decent work? Um, and that in itself is a challenge which I think needs to be looked at. But I think the, the overriding thing from um, my point of view in particular is that really we need to change the way we look at the informal economy because, you know, a lot of people see it as illegal or unethical, but it's really is a massive generalization it's really unfair because most people working in the informal economy are working very very hard to earn a decent income and they don't have the social protection and the access to opportunities that people do when they're in the formal economy so i think it's it's just a really fascinating area of growth thank you very much adriana and i'm, I'm going to ask tim to come in next but after that if any of the panelists want to comment on what other panelists have said before we go to questions briefly then please let me know wave at me or um, do something um, so we've talked Tim uh, we, we, let's talk about this question of financing what governments need to do to support employment growth um, how do we balance the needs of governments to do the borrowing that they all need particularly in the poorer parts of the world to support employment growth with the cost of the borrowing that that imposes and um, the economic uh, danger that that brings. How do you solve that easy problem? <laughs> Thanks, Stuart, and good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, I mean, as implied in the question, government borrowing is a vital tool for investment and, and also for coping with crises um, to help people through when there are sudden shocks. And um, employment growth in the private sector, in the public sector, depends on public goods such as education, such as transport. Uh, in the world today, we have this um, ridiculous uh, inequality in government access to finance. So to contrast, at the moment, the UK government can borrow in its own currency um, for 10 years at a fixed interest rate of just 0.2%, which is the lowest in its history. And um, we contrast that with Ghana, where they have to borrow from international financiers who demand to um, lend in a foreign currency, which means it's very volatile, um, and pay around 8 to 10% interest on those loans. And at that level of interest, it is much harder to invest um, in the opportunities that are needed. 
Now, um, this has been exacerbated by the coronavirus crisis. Um, we've seen huge government stimulus packages, money creation packages in the UK, Europe, the United States. Um, and most lower income countries are just unable um, to do this. Um, in fact, many lower income countries were already in significant debt problems before the coronavirus crisis hit. Um, we did a study at Jubilee Debt Campaign at the start of this year, um, where we found that uh, with the countries with the highest debt payments, their public spending was already falling um, ahead of the crisis. And so it's very difficult for governments um, to invest for public services to be provided if you're having to cut government spending at a time when we should be having um, large increases to meet the sustainable development goals. So um, because we have this huge inequality of access resources, I think it's important for us to remember just how kind of much money and resources that are out there in the world and um, so trying to find multilateral solutions to um, enable finance to um, get to governments much more easily and there's obviously lots of aspects to that and, and we can um, might come on to discuss them just a few um, suggestions of areas to look. One of the reasons for this inequality in government access to finance is the dependence on foreign as opposed to domestic finance. And the more we can do to tackle capital flight, um, tackle tax avoidance, keep money in countries, the more the money there will be in the domestic financial system for both governments and the private sector. Um, there is, we can have much more multilateral support. Um, there's things called special drawing rights at the um, IMF, which um, at the moment could, would be a way of creating money for those countries that aren't able to do it themselves through quantitative easing. Um, for countries that are already in debt crisis, we do just need debt cancellation. Um, governments will not be able to borrow at low interest rates if they're constrained by having high debts already. And finally, transparency, that it doesn't matter how much access to money governments have if it's not well spent. And there is a huge problem of a lack of transparency over borrowing and lending at the moment and how that impedes the ability of civil society, parliaments, the media uh, to hold lenders and governments to account over how money is used. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before I take any questions, anyone, does anyone on the panel want to just chip in in response to anything? Uh, no need to, but if you do want to say something, please feel free. No? Okay. Um, let's start with the question. Um, Katia again has asked a question. Um, uh, she actually specifically says for Barbara, but it's really for anyone who wants to take this on. Could the environment uh, be a source of employment if we uh, have public dedication to monetizing, rewi rewilding, conservation. Um, would that be an employment possibility which could be uh, uh, ex extended across different countries? Barbara, what do you think of that? Oh, very positive. I mean, I think that is one of the key um, areas that you, you can really look at. Um, and, and, and she's right, it's both here in this country, but also, you know, in the developing or the, the low income countries as well. And, and I'd extend it beyond the environment. Um, really into the whole question of, you know, we've got to get to carbon zero and that's going to need a lot of investment around, you know, everywhere, frankly. Um, but for the sorts of um, low income countries I was talking about, that through perhaps adaptation funding and so on is a real chance to create jobs that will be appropriate for young people and they will be skilled up. You know, they can be skilled up to be able to, to do them, really. And I just add un on to that because it's sort of part of the package. Um, we haven't really mentioned agriculture because we don't really talk about it much, you know, in the in the Western world. But clearly developments in agriculture and modernizing agriculture, you know, sub-Saharan Africa and so on in particular, also lend themselves to a lot more jobs um, being there. But in all these cases, the money has to come from somewhere and it has to be figured out, you know, how that how we can get money into into those right places so you can do you know, really appropriate job creation. I don't think, I think the same issue is the same in the UK. It's just within a country as to how you get money in the right places to, you know, to skill up for, you know, for uh, rechanging the, you know, all our houses in the UK and the jobs that go with that. And maybe just while we're on jobs, I'll just add into the final one, of course, the caring sector. 
and, and, and there's plenty of room in the world for a lot of caring and a lot of caring to be paid for. And the question is how we do it and how we make these, these jobs actually really acceptable. Um, you know, making sure that the pay and, and conditions are absolutely right. There's, there's plenty of caring work, but we have just always grossly, grossly, um, you, you know, are really not thought about how important they are to society, really, and not paid them appropriately at all. Thank you. Does, any, does anyone else want to come in on this question of the, the green agenda and the way in which it could support employment growth in the future? Okay, we have we have another question. If I may, yeah. please go on. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I think I think it's uh, it's really important. And one thing you notice is that many of the um, uh, many of the lower or middle income countries, in fact, uh, if you look at energy production, the uh, particularly electricity generation, it's largely coming from non carbon sources. Take Ethiopia, for example. Ethiopia is is now an exporter of of electricity, also looking at um, non-carbon sources for its own uh, off-grid uh, generation because it needs to reach uh, many parts of the country which aren't re reached by the, the national grid. So we're seeing them become leaders. Kenya is, is another example um, where a, a new geothermal plant has been opened recently. So I think, I think there's a, the chance now for uh, lower income countries not only to, to invest themselves in, in this, but also to show the way uh, for, for all of us. Um, as I say, I think Ethiopia is now a um, every single bit of every single part of its electricity generation uh, infrastructure is is green, is renewable. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Deborah specifically for Adriana. Uh, um, Deborah asks Adriana if you can give an example, what sort of examples of women successfully accessing loans to start businesses where the money didn't come from government you know the success of the ngo uh, civil society yeah. sector in doing that can you give us maybe a story or an illustration of where it works well yeah absolutely i mean um in terms of um in the informal economy it is obviously quite hard to access finance through micro um lenders um, but um, actually, Jeremy probably will have a lot to add on this as well um, in terms of the leasing um, side of things. So um, leasing equipment and things like that in order to um, access finance to start those businesses. Um, the area that we really look at and we support um, as Peace Child is the village loan savings groups. So local um, savings groups um, where the majority of women in the informal economy do actually um, gain access to finance. Um, and this is basically, as um, you may well know, um, groups of women who come together to um, put money in. And there are challenges with that in that um, often they're run by a literate member of the community, which can be, um, usually is a male, um, and there can be some lack of um, transparency and trust within village loan savings groups. Um, so we've spent quite a bit of time actually working out how um, illiterate women can actually understand finances and deepen their financial inclusion. So using different tools like colours and symbols to help them to understand what money has actually been paid in and what money is due to be paid back out. Um, and you know, last year alone, I mean, we're a small organisation, last year alone we um, actually supported over 2,000 women and over the last few years we've actually supported 15,000 women. Um, to build businesses of this nature and gain access through these informal mechanisms. Um, but certainly, um, we work quite closely as well with BRAC. Um, BRAC are a very good organisation actually um, providing loans to people in these situations. Um, and that works very well because the interest rates are much lower um, and the risk associated it is much lower. So a lot of it's about um, women and, and men, whoever is working in the informal economy, but understanding what services are available to them. So, oops, sorry if I'm going, please do stop me, but um, a lot of it is about them knowing what is there and what is um, meant, to, meant to be. So how do I access finance? Um, which organisations offer me what? And what are my rights? Because um, often, if you've, um, if you've been brought up in a um, rural setting, in agriculture or anything like that, you don't have a lot of um, exposure to the law and to things like that. It's all handled within your local communities. 
So really it's about um, creating the business services around those loans that women and men know how to access services to grow once they get that finance and how to manage it is really important. Sorry if that was a bit long-winded. <laughs> Thank you very much. I've got, I'm, I'm going to give you uh, the panel a couple of questions or a couple of comments that have come up on more general topics and see if anyone wants to bite on them. One is on tax havens. Um, I don't know, Tim may want to bite on this one, which is what the UN can do to pressure member countries to stop uh, facilitating the tax havens that capital escapes to. Um, and the second question, which was a remark I saw someone, I think it was Tom, but I, forgive me if I got the name wrong, um, about how the problem of corruption, of, of um, state corruption, and how that dis disincentivizes people to transition from precarious informal work into more formal employment. Um, does that remain a huge problem? I suspect it does. Does anyone want to address either of those questions? I can yeah. just jump in quickly on um, tax havens. Um, there's definitely a role for the UK in particular because there are um, many tax havens in UK's overseas territories and crown dependencies. And actually the UK Parliament has taken some action to try and get those um, territories to do more reporting um, which will um, help countries um, tackle capital flight and tax avoidance. There's at the UN level, there has been, um, at the moment, rules around tax tend to be set um, in the OECD, um, the group of um, well, Western countries and developing countries have been arguing for a UN tax body so that the um, global rules on tax can have more input and decision-making power from developing countries. And so that, if it was created, would be a way that the UN would then formally have a role in tax. It's tended to be resisted by um, Western countries and so uh, hasn't happened so far. Um, just finally, on tax havens, ultimately the money, the resources have to end up somewhere. And so we need to, um, think back to the real economy. And again, for those of us in the UK, a large amount of that money ultimately ends up in the UK in things like the UK um, housing market. And um, we could be doing far more to help countries track down um, stolen assets and return them. Thank you. Does anyone else want to come in? Well, yeah, I'll just have a go on the... Um... The corruption question, but it's, I think some of it was said a bit earlier, really. Um, I mean, one of the key issues to deal with corruption is, of course, as people have said, transparency. And at least, you know, to some extent, donor agencies can help with that by insisting on transparency and insisting, you know, what, what the publics of the country will need to know. But it is also, I think we haven't mentioned actually civil society in countries an awful lot. And yet um, they are a fantastic route or actually following the money, if you like, you know, if, if you can get the, the stats and find out you know, where money is going, you know, that, that has been such a good method of pointing out that money did not arrive where it was supposed to and had been committed to, you know, I mean, and, and these are very basic things. I mean, when I was in Oxford, I used to work on this particularly, but, you know, putting the budget on the school door. Um, that they were supposed to have was very useful, both for finding out whether the district had given them the money, but also to find out how many teachers they should have had and turning up and all those sorts of things. And I think um, supporting local civil society to help galvanise this sense of accountability to the public of the country have got to be one of the ways through that. Now, there are all sorts of other things, you know, tax havens, you know, money laundering, every, you know, there's lots of other technical financial things, but there is something about getting back to the people and, and finding ways to help them hold their own governments to account, really. Thank you. One last question before I, I ask each of you to, to give us a, a takeaway recommendation for, for what to focus on in the next few years. And then it's from John. I'm paraphrasing John's question here. He says, we're seeing expansive borrowing to fund responses to COVID across the world. Can we use this type of borrowing in, in safer times for priorities, or is it only possible during global disasters to get the orthodoxy to be broken? I think we're all nodding our heads at that one, rather. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of orthodoxies I think need to be broken out of COVID. And I think one of the biggest ones is the inequality one, frankly. You know, it's put it to the fore. Don't let's use, lose this opportunity now. 
And do you just to, uh, do, 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 do you the panel sense that the the economic um, the intellectual side of this in our international institutions, uh, in the World Bank, in IMF, are they adapting as a result of COVID to be more expansive, to be more uh, open to this sort of novel ways of financing than they were maybe 10, 15 years ago? I'd say yes and no. Um, we've seen lots of headlines and research from the likes of the IMF and World Bank that do break um, with the orthodoxy. What we tend to see is that doesn't follow down to their individual advice to countries and country programs. And that kind of goes a bit more under the radar and scrutiny. We see, need to see a um, much broader range of thinking in that advice that's actually be giving, being given on the ground and innovative thinking. Um, rather than just the headlines um, that they create and saying that inequality needs to be tackled, actually um, giving um, advice for that to happen. If I may just add, Stuart, that I, I also think that um, because governments, you know, our own government here in the UK and elsewhere have borrowed so much and shown that they can borrow so much and rightly so to tackle this problem, the, the excuse that's often raised that we shouldn't be um, doing what we can to support uh, uh, low-income countries and lower middle-income countries in their development efforts in future because it's just too much when we're talking about uh, perhaps even at 0.7 percent 14 billion pounds and just last month the UK government borrowed 35 billion pounds in a month I think that argument we have to resist very very strongly in future absolutely um, well, the clock's against us, I'm afraid. So I'm just going to ask each of you to give us your policy priority, one or two at most, uh, from, from the areas you've been speaking about. Barbara, let's start with you. OK, there's a saying, um, nothing about us without us. That's what young people are saying around the world. And I think that would be a very good one for everybody to follow. Um, governments, um, uh, donor countries, philanthropists, anybody, um, to really get them properly involved. That's my one. Now, I've got a funny second one, and it's because I've been working a bit on whether we should have a, a UN convention on global pandemics. And I won't describe all that, but there is something we have to do, which is a big, big problem, which is to understand again that we are one globe and we are all in this together, not just COVID, but climate change and everything else. And really working now to really help people understand how we all connect and you know to, to to move away from this you know uh, very territorial approach to solving everything really. Thank you very much. Um, let's go to Jeremy next. Uh, thanks, Jim. I, for me, I think the fact is we're we're going to face a jobless joblessness crisis all over the world. We're going to face one in the UK. We're going to face one in Europe. We're going to face one. US and in, in, in low income countries. Therefore, it's not just a case of thinking of what might be good in Tanzania or Kenya. It's a, it's a case of thinking what's going to be important for young people right across the world. And I think we've got a lot in the UK to learn from the kind of experiences that um, many lower income countries have gone through in, in creating jobs. And we need to work on this together. This is, this is if you like, the first time that all of us have got to face this together. If we have three or four million people unemployed in the UK, God forbid, I really hope that that is not the case, we're going to have to take it just as seriously. And maybe the open people's eyes, or all of our eyes, to the importance of job, the creation of jobs and livelihoods for everybody. Thank you. Adriana, what would be your policy? Well, I, um, I couldn't agree more with what's just been said there in terms of the priorities um, going forwards. I think um, what I would add is um, something around um, the business support um, and actually helping um, incorporate entrepreneurship within education um, in some of the um, lower income countries um, in particular. Um, but also here in the UK is is just as important that young people can take responsibility for their futures and they have um, choices that they can make um, and what Barbara said um, there to, at the very beginning sums it all up really um, you know she started off by saying that 65% of the population in developing countries are under 25 so and we know that the majority of the workforce um, is in informal economies and places like that so we need to really be listening to young people and really incorporate 
them into everything we do and into the conversation itself and giving them the tools that they can really um, fulfill their own potentials and have choices because it's about opportunity. Thank you. Some really consistent themes emerging here. Thanks. Tim, over to you lastly. Um, so building on this transparency and accountability, um, to have one place where civil society actors can go and see all the loans that a government is taking out. And even if individual governments don't sign up to doing that, you only need lenders to be disclosing the loans for everyone to see them. So a set of regulations re that requires lenders um, to have to disclose their loans to governments that um, lending to a government is public money and so the public have a right to know about it. And the UK is central to that because most um, international loans to governments uh, happen under the UK legal system, so it has a crucial part to play in creating that. Well, listen, thank you all very, very much for some very really incredibly widespread examples that you brought in here and uh, some very stimulating thoughts about the barriers and also the opportunities and challenges ahead. So. Um, Thank you to all of you. And we're going to slide seamlessly again into our third and final panel, um, which is on the question of resilient employment. And we're going to be looking actually at some issues that have been raised already on agriculture and technology in this, in this panel. And um, let me introduce our three participants in that panel, who hopefully are going to be moved onto your screens. Um, we have Dr. Lata Narayana Swami, from, who's a lecturer in International Development at the University of Leeds. Hello, Lata. Hello. Hi. Uh, we have Dr. Nisha Krishnan, who's uh, the Climate Resilience Practice at the World Resources Institute. Hello, Nisha. Hi. Hello. And we also have Alan Lockie, Head of the Future Work Centre inside the Royal Society of Art. Uh, Arts. He was formerly the Research Director for DEMOS. Hello, Alan. Hi, Stuart. Hi there. Thanks all for joining us. Um, um, Nisha, I think we'll start start with you. And I think the question that's come up actually in different forms before, which is the interaction between uh, the environment and in particular the agricultural workforce. Um, what are the ways in which environmental degradation and climate change impact on the agricultural workforce, the primary sector workforce? And what interventions can make the primary sector more resilient in the face of climate change. Thanks, Stuart. I think this has, you're right, this has come up, I think, in the in just the previous panel with Katya's questions and Barbara's response. And I think one of the things that we're already seeing is that environmental degradation and climate change impacts from everything from locust uh, invasions in sort of the Eastern Africa region to wildfires, uh, to just shifting productive zones, right? So I think we're seeing, for example, in Costa Rica, where coffee as being one of the primary export crops are no longer viable just because of the heat and uh, sort of rainfall changes. And I think one of the things that we're also seeing is that the techniques that used to work before are no longer productive, right? So you're actually not seeing crop yields uh, come as often as before. You're seeing different disease inter uh, diseases come through. So I think one of the, I think that's obviously impacting um, labor demand. But I think the other thing that we also have to consider is the fact that labor supply too is going to be affected, right? So we're seeing different uh, temperature and humidity um, impacts on outdoor labor. And the fact is that we have to think about this as not just economic security, but health impacts of this. And so is this actually viable in the future as, as a sector and as, as um as sort of we were talking about the issue of youth and whether youth are going to be involved in the agriculture sector or whether that's going to go somewhere. So I think there are multiple impacts that we're already seeing and that are only going to increase um, in the future. I think one of the things that we've been working on, for example, at uh, World Resources Institute and through some of the work on the Global Commission on Adaptation is looking at how smallholder farmers could be supported, right? So I think the issue of financial inclusion has come up and the whether we are actually able to invest in smallholder farmers and give them access to the resources to make their own uh, economic decisions rather than being told what to do. So again, this issue of agency and whether they have the capacity and the knowledge um, to to invent, reinvent their own future. And I think that's one of the pieces where governments and development finance institutions can really help 
uh, shape sort of their future and help shape their future rather than having a prescriptive understanding of what the agriculture sector should look like. And I think that's something that's not just for, say, low-income countries, but for example, the wine growers in California and Australia or the farmers in in sort of middle-income countries like Vietnam. So I think this is actually a global sort of uh, issue, not just sort of something that is restricted to low-income countries. And I'll stop there. Can I, that's a fascinating issue. Can I just ask quickly, I mean, you may not know the answer to this, but you're more likely to than I am, let's face it. Um, are there good examples of international cooperation across borders in this in terms of resilience and adaptation because obviously with with um climate change there's there's a tendency for viable viable um agriculture to shift regionally as well and so you're going to have to have international cooperation do we see that happening or do we see too little of it happening i think we we are seeing some more of it happening i think most of it for example has happened i think this issue of conflict has come up right and i think we've seen it happen sort of in the eastern african region where you have pastoralism um sort of shifting across borders say in, uh, in northern kenya in ethiopia and sort of that region so i think there is uh sort of more cooperation, but probably not to the extent that we need to see. And this is going to come up, for example, in water resource sharing. Um, I think we're seeing some of this coming up in sort of the, uh, and this is probably a controversial topic, but sort of the Egypt, Ethiopia, Great uh, Renaissance Dam conversation right now. So I think more and more of this is going to happen. And it's something that we should be uh, cognizant of. So I think it's a really great discussion probably for us to think about. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nisha. Alan, let, let's turn to you. And, the, and the, the, the universal basic income has come up already. And of course, that's usually connected to the question of technology and labor replacing technological uh, development. Um, so what impact will ongoing changes in technology and capital investment have on employment in manufacturing? Um, and how can we promote employment growth in the face of this that seemingly inexorable trend to labour replacing capital investment. Uh, I mean, one thing we, we can do is, is have a universal basic income, so I'm very much in, in favour of that. Um, I mean, it's very difficult at the moment because, you, you know, to think about the future of work because so many of the mega drivers almost crashed into a brick wall at the start of this year. Uh, even as something as deep and as central to the economy before this year as as the clustering of success in major cities is now seemingly a, a question that, that, that that's up for debate. Um, I think to answer this question, you do have to try and engage with the pandemic and try and look at the interaction of uh, the relationship between the pandemic and technology and will it accelerate the trends that we saw before this year or will it decelerate it? I think you know, we're still in it, and there's a so this is very much a little new case studies and, and, and interviews rather than hard data. But there are kind of three reasons for thinking that technology will accelerate out of the pandemic, and one very big reason for thinking it will decelerate. Uh, the very big reason for thinking it will decelerate is that when economies are hit by 20% output drops, that's not an investment friendly environment as a general rule. That said, the tech sector is one of the strongest performing sectors within this. Some technology firms have accelerated and grown throughout the pandemic. Uh, and so I think the, the three reasons really are that it may be as we adapt to a new normal, that technology investment and technology is, is part of that. I'm thinking here of things like Amazon's cashierless stores, where you don't even need to interact with a human. You don't even need to uh, input your financial details to to, to the transaction, you just go around the shop with goods. Uh, there's obviously the traditional point, and this is the central point uh, when we think about manufacturing, which is the cost of labor point. You know, robots do not get called for by contact tracers to go and self-isolate. Right? No one does in the UK, uh, but put that to one side. Uh, they don't, robots don't even do that in South Korea where, where those systems work. Uh, and then this, the big one really is, the, is changing consumer preferences. And I think this is kind of the story that we need to engage with when we think about the future of work more broadly. And when we think about how technology will affect the labor market, it's not necessarily a story of displacement. We go down that avenue too much. Um, we've, at the RSA, done a lot of research on, on, on 
segmenting the labour market by pandemic and future work risks and if we're talking about manufacturing specifically um you know automotive uh, manufacturing is is high risk to covid high risk to automation uh, furniture manufacturing is high risk to covid high risk to automation uh, clothes manufacturing is high risk to automation high risk to covid and then some other industries uh, such as other transport manufacturing are medium automation high risk covid but in all of these industries they're affected by the pandemic and the consumer uh, behavior within the within those sectors is affected by the pandemic and that's really the story about how the labor markets change because of technology that uh, that, are, that, that i think we need to engage with more than anything else you know give one example that's illustrative of this the fastest while whilst we were talking about driverless cars and the, the theoretical possibility of technology changing the fourth fastest job growth in the uk over the last 10 years was van drivers but that is a story of technological transformation because it's a story of a massive change in consumer behavior in the retail industry so we really have to engage with how consumer behavior affects business models and have that as the central topic for understanding the labor market and how technology uh, will affect an investment behavior will be reflected in that uh, I don't know if we've got time for the second part of the question, which is what. Yeah, please. Um, what do we do about what do we do about it? Well, I think again, looking at the pandemic, you know, I think there is this kind of interesting synergy between the pandemic and the future of work trends, and, and, and in a sense, that's because both the, the technological impact on the labour market, the displacement of jobs, and the pandemic are demand shocks that are highly concentrated in particular sectors and particular occupations that where the, the demand for labor suddenly transforms very very quickly in the pandemic is so i do think you get three strategies in both response to the pandemic and uh in more medium term one is job protection uh at the moment that's very much state-led and furlough schemes things like that i think the interesting thing there is uh, you know, a lot of the, the, the jobs that are most vulnerable to the pandemic, things in the arts and entertainment sector, are actually jobs that are previously resilient to long term. They're well paid, they're good jobs. And so there's a, there's a real mismatch between the short and medium term horizons there. Uh, upskilling, of course, skills investment, we know about that. It's really, really important. But I think the main thing uh, is this idea of transition services. Uh, we need, you know, if the economy is restructuring, whether it's because of the pandemic or technology, that means you need better active labour market policies that can redeploy uh, workers between sectors and into sectors uh, where the, the demand for labour is still is still maintained. Uh, so I think, you know, we're going to build these systems, hopefully, uh, as a part of the pandemic, and they need to be expanded uh, going forward, but they also need to be underpinned by um, by strong uh, worker voice organisations and unions and their, their involvement in them. Uh, we need to make sure that conversations about tech um, and technology rollout uh, move towards job design, different roles and facilitate a better work uh, rather than a conversation about getting rid of all people all the time. It has to be kind of uh, an equal power between workers you have to increase worker bargaining power in the economy. It's even more important now than it ever was. Uh, and so, yeah, I do, I, I do think that that you do need to provide uh, a stronger, uh, as part of that transition, as part of allowing people to be secure when they are moving between massive uh, life changes and and, uh, and sectors. Uh, we need a, a more generous, more universal welfare state that allows people to do that. So they do Let's go full circle, support the universal energy. Thank you, Alan. Um, and over to you, Lata. So we've talked a lot about employment growth and, and the way that employment growth produces security. What alternatives are there for promoting economic security beyond employment growth? So firstly, um, thank you so much uh, for having me. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'm not sure if my uh, 
if you're all seeing me looking a little bit frozen, hopefully my, maybe if I turn my camera on and off. We can hear, we can hear you there, so do carry on. Okay. So I suppose my, my response to that question um, is really about maybe starting by challenging the underlying assumption of the question. And that is to say, I'm not sure that it was a fair assumption to say that employment growth always leads to economic security. So as we've seen with the rise of the gig economy in the UK, the establishment of sweatshops where employment rights are deliberately withheld in the name of promoting economic growth, being in work does not always translate to economic security, nor does it lead to the many other things that we might want it to lead to. So there's been lots of really, really, really fantastic conversations. I've enjoyed all the panels so far, and I absolutely would want work to be all the things that have been talked about so far. We need to feel valued, right? It's enshrined in the Declaration of UN Declaration of Human Rights. And it isn't just about money. You know, work is about being valued. Work is about participation in society. Work is about that sort of reciprocity that you get in being part of a labor force. Personal pride, skill building. But there are quite a lot of jobs that don't offer any of those things. Um, and historically has always been the case. So I think we need to not just ask about employment growth, but there are important conversations within that, I would argue, around work uh, employment redistribution. And I think that is also a really interesting conversation that we can have in relation to unpaid work, right? If we look at the gender division of labor, um, and that, that came up very powerfully, I think, in the first panel, right? We have to ask important questions about the, the, the gender division of labor, which tends to privatize reproductive labor, unpaid labor, caring labor, but also tends to undervalue the way, which I think Barbara mentioned in, in particular, tends to undervalue the performance of paid care work in, 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 in our, uh, more outward facing public spaces. So we need to understand, and it mirrors the understanding that we have, and it's nice to hear you talk, Alan, about sort of the um, expansion of welfare states. I mean, that conversation around you know, employment mirrors the understanding of what we expect welfare states to do. So it's not just about wealth creation, right? There's a little bit of a, a myth around the fact that it's capitalism that has lifted people out of poverty. Actually, that's not true. Capitalism cannot exist without states. And what we've had is is actually states mitigating the mitigating the excesses of capitalism, and in quite varied ways. Welfare states are quite diverse. So the mechanisms to redistribute wealth in ways that might need, meet collective needs, so health, education, pensions, childcare, we've talked about all of that this evening. And we need to engage with that around employment. And also, I think COVID, in thinking about what this pandemic has taught us, obviously, nobody wants a pandemic. It's an absolutely hideous situation to find ourselves in. But if we can't reflect on the things that this pandemic is, is actually forcing us to see with more clarity, I think we are missing an opportunity. And one of them, I think, in terms of employment is actually what counts as work that we value? What value are we placing on different types of work? So we have to ask questions about, for instance, the value of the nursing and the care work and the teachers who we know these are professions that are not only feminized in thinking about the gender division of labor, but also serially undervalued. And there are lots and lots of debates that we need to be engaging with constructively in terms of thinking about you know, what kind of employment growth we're looking for, but where? And I think um, it was raised sort of in the previous panel around thinking about, you know, jobs and retraining and health in the public sector more widely. So there are um, debates and, and discussions to be had. But if we assume, as I'm sure we all would, that we are collectively invested in promoting good job growth. So when I think of a good job, I'm happy to say that I'm in a job where I feel valued. That shouldn't be a very exclusive privileged position. I'd want more people to feel the way they do about their job as I do. But then even on its own, this isn't necessarily going to lead uh, to economic security. But we also then need to be thinking about wider human health and well-being, to which then economic security should fundamentally contribute. Because I suppose in my mind, if it doesn't contribute to wider economic, wider um, health and well-being, what's the point, right? So we need a little bit of joined up thinking there. So in response to the question about alternatives, we need accountable states that are willing and able to regulate employers and associated working conditions more effectively. That's really, really important, particularly when we think about 
um, what some countries offer to our global economy, particularly, I don't want to say low income countries, because we get quite a mixed picture in terms of the sorts of working conditions we get globally, right? So countries like India and China are growing quite rapidly, but so is inequality. And there are questions around working conditions. So we get lots of bifurcation within those economies. But there is a real drive then for us to be thinking about working conditions and that we shouldn't be driving those standards down. But reflecting the conversation in the previous panel, I absolutely would concur that global cooperation and then driving those standards up is a really key contribution. Lots of talk today about UBI. Yep, I'm totally on board. Let's talk about universal basic income. I would want to throw into that mix, though, if we move that lens towards meeting human need, really interesting debates and conversations going around about also not just universal basic income, but universal basic services. Because actually, the kinds of things that I, you know, and I teach in this area, and one of the things I'll always tell students is actually money has limits, right? I can have all the money in the world, but if I live in a rural area with no services, it doesn't buy me anything. So we need to be thinking much more dynamically about the nature of the cooperation that we can draw on to actually develop those services. Just like, you know, so you, we've been talking about, say, the expansion of welfare states. Now, there are lots of welfare state models, right? The UK is one. The US looks quite different, actually, in lots of ways, as we know, with healthcare in particular, it's not functional in the way that we might think is important um, in Europe. And so... Then we need then, but UBI and UBS, there are debates, but also where economic security is fundamentally delinked or no longer dependent on the selling of our labor power, then we can start thinking about what alternatives might look like. So my final point here, if I still have time, if that's okay, Stuart, would be that we would I'd want us to look at economic security in the round. What is it for? I would argue that the end goal is not economic security, but human and planetary health and well-being. This then allows us to think more creatively and critically about the social, political and economic settlement that we might collectively decide shapes our lives and then what counts as work and how we value that work as part of those deliberations. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that actually leads on to one of the questions that we've been asked um, from another John, um, which is, is it basically, is it time... Should we should we stop talking about paid work as a goal of state intervention in the employment uh, area and, and think about fulfilling lives instead? Um, but I want to spe specifically focus on the first part of that paid work. Is paid work the wrong thing to be trying to maximise, um, given what you said, uh, Lata? I mean, it's a good question because in a way it opens up wider questions about what we're paying for. Right. So if if it's about, as I said, so let's let we take the pandemic. Right. What is the value of the labor that's being provided during this pandemic? And here we can see a huge mismatch between the social value that's that is provided by the kinds of labor that we are now saying collectively we value in the UK. We've stood on our doorsteps and clapped. And yet somehow it's very difficult then to have conversations about valuing that labor more. And these are, and I'm, and and it is important, I think, to be really open about the fact that these are deeply politicized questions. So we have lots of debates, for instance, about public sector pay. We have questions, you know, thinking about, say, you know, how we talk about debt. Questions of public sector pay raise challenges for governments that are very that are steeped in thinking about how they manage public spending. We're not having those same debates about the value of work across public and private sector. So there's lots of pushback, for instance, on capping executive pay. But when we actually look at the numbers, for instance, what we know is that there's a couple of ways to look at this. So one of the interesting sorts of statistics is to look at the difference between, you know, workers on the shop, on the shop floor, as it were, in a, in a, in a factory in, say, Japan where the, the head of that factory or the director or whatever might have a pay packet that's maybe, I don't know, 10 or 20 times bigger. Those numbers have inflated out of proportion to the value that that director might uh, bring in other contexts. So we know that CEO pay in, say, the US and indeed the UK far outstrips, you know, it could be anywhere from a sort of 100 to 400 times what people are making on the shop floor. So then what is the value of, of the relative value of the labor in terms of um, the, the value that's being created by that labor, right? We know that Jeff Bezos is on the cusp of being a trillionaire. Now, 
you know, we can have conversations about how much credit he gets for inventing Amazon. But it seems quite odd then that we've got at the same time zero hours contracts in his factories. Um, and 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 you know pandemic outbreaks in 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 those warehouses and we're not asking questions about the value of work so um sorry that kind of turned into a little bit of a rant but i'm not sure if that answers the question okay thank you i've got another question changing tax slightly i think this is for, for, for nisha uh it's about drugs nisha if that's an area that you're comfortable discussing so the question is from katia as smallholders and subsistence agriculturists attempt to cope with climate change can legalizing soft drugs provide a market for hardy crops that can provide decent remuneration and steady demand? What do you think? So I would say that it's probably not a controversial question to ask just because, you know, I think we're having an open conversation about what the possibilities are in light of the future. And I think one of the things that um, we need to probably discuss more as a sort of in terms of the global corporation piece is, um, what is our value, I think, of of the labor that produces these crops versus the societal value of these drugs in the first place, right? So I think that is the conversation that we would need to have to be able to sort of discuss this in some ways. I also think at the end of the day, we're going to face the same sort of environmental degradation and climate change impacts even on um, sort of the soft drug production, right? So the extent to which um, we are still going to have, I think, one of the best responses to the de environmental degradation and climate change impacts is something that Barbara and Katya, actually your question earlier points to, which is how do we actually value nature? And how do we include that in how we think about economic value, right? And the extent to which we do uh, nature-based solutions or adaptation, rather than thinking about what else we could grow in, in this light of, um, in this sort of uh, no pun intended climate uh, and the changing climate that we have. So, slightly uh, off topic, but I think uh, the deflection here is the fact that we just really need to value nature much better for us to get a handle on how we actually do better um, going, uh, given the limited resources that we have. So, sorry. Thank you. I wanted, to, I wanted to ask Alan a question actually about, about this question of, of technology not necessarily being a labor replacing force, uh, because that's the general assumption in policy debates uh, and, and more generally. I guess the question, in general, the extent to which, I mean, every generation has its own debate about whether technology is going to make significant parts of the workforce redundant. Is it different this time than before? And are, to the extent that there are compensating jobs that will be sort of uh, created, is that all going to be in the service sector? I mean, or primarily in the service sector, or is that too naive a way of thinking about it? Because we think about, you know, expanding, particularly in the developed world, expanding um, leisure industry, care industry, educational services, these being the growth areas. Are we seeing tech technology, if it, if it is not necessarily uh, the enemy of employment, it's at least going to be responsible for a massive shift towards service sector employment as the dominant sector, or is that too general a view? Um, I mean, I think it's always... Uh... I'm, I'm always a little bit more skeptical about the i mean i think i think it i think it's right and i think i agree with to a certain extent with people like daniel suskind who suggests that it is theoretically possible that technology uh will and can replace pretty much all human demand all human labor tasks uh, if you can think of a job it, it, it's probably possible particularly artificial intelligence is is, is a big game changer potentially uh and it does i mean you know in his book there's, there are all sorts of wonderful examples of of, of, of uh a, we talk about creative jobs even of, of ai being able to compose beautiful symphonies and things like this you know there's almost nothing that they can't do um that said i do think that world is quite a long way away and i do think that um you know humans have shown capitalism maybe you might say have shown a tremendous ability to redeploy humans into or to, to, to add value it's also kind of marx's point where the, the value that will be added will be the human value uh, and i do really feel that that uh, is probably the trajectory that will go on in the main so that that that, that probably 
although I wouldn't hold the, the, the opinion that firmly, uh, given that, you know, the automation debate was raging at the time and the UK was closest to sort of what happened for 34 years, notwithstanding the very uh, uh, correct points made about the fact that some of those jobs were not delivering economic security, there were still lots of jobs. Um, I do probably agree that generally we are not in service jobs and we are looking at deployments of human where technology, the deployment of human, uh, of the human value uh, it will probably be more so. Can I just jump in there as well? Sorry, Stuart. Um, I think one of the things that, at least when I think about technology, it goes a little bit beyond sort of the automation conversation and the sort of our use of computers and um, sort of science, but also into entrepreneurship, right? So the extent to which, for example, in agriculture or even in um, things like transportation or whatever other sector there might be there's there's a there's a slice of this which is just about entrepreneurship and human ingenuity right so the extent to which we actually do things differently um and because of the capitalist nature that we're in the ability to monetize that right and i think there is so much room for us to to do things differently and to use that as a technological sort of innovation in and of itself and then create employment through that and i think there's there's something there that um, that we could really touch upon. So one of the things, for example, uh, maybe to Jeremy's sort of experience in sort of the Eastern Africa, Kenya area, you know, they, because of the devolved sort of and decentralized nature of their government, all of the 47 counties now have uh, locally driven, are going to have locally driven um, adaptation funds where communities themselves decide what technologies they're going to use, whether that is their sort of right intervention that they want to have, and then they implement it, right? So the extent to which you have actual innovation, even at the ground level with actual participation, I think is a conversation we should also be thinking about in context of technology investments. So. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, t again, time is against us. And I, I do want to finish at nine because uh, we've tested the patience of our amazing audience, uh, as, as well as you, the panelists. Um, so I'm going to ask, as I have the previous panels, for each of you to say maybe in a minute, a minute and a half, what you think the specific policy priorities should be in the themes that you've discussed so far. Um, Nisha, do you, do you want to start as our first speaker? Sure, of course. Um, so at least I think one thing clearly is that we probably should really aim for this low carbon, zero carbon future. Uh, that obviously is a beyond anything else is should be a priority. The second piece of that is the fact that we do need to invest um, and sort of decentralize a lot of finance into local and community level organizations, as well as governments um, and private sector, right? So the whole conversation about financial inclusion and financial access is absolutely key to addressing even the climate challenge. So um, I think those are probably the two pieces that I would leave us with. Thank you. Thank you very much. Alan. I think I, I mean, I think it is this idea of a, of, of a kind of end-to-end -end transition service that will redeploy workers. Uh, I like Swedish job security councils. Uh, they both reinforce and help spread collective bargaining, the early intervention, uh, intervene before people, well, when people are made a redundant, redundant and have long redundancy times in Sweden. And so I think that's a really, really practical policy that will be needed for the pandemic, for the future of work, but also for climate change. I think one of the interesting things about lockdown is that it revealed the scale of the transition, uh, really. You know, you saw a massive change in consumption uh, behavior, which was potentially quite beneficial towards the environment, uh, but that, that, that led to, you know, potentially very, very, very high in environmental there still there wasn't a fellow scheme and, and massive uh, inequality experience and outcome. Uh, so I think these kind of transition services are really essential for all uh, the three big challenges that we're facing in the next 10 years. Thank you, Alan. And Lata, lastly, over to you. Thank you. Um, I, I mean, I think I would want to build on some of the conclusions from the previous panels, really, and suggest that there have been lots of discussions around 
bottom up insights, you know, how we can empower people. But I would love to see that combined with some sorts of insights on, on structural concerns. And particularly when it comes to, say, climate or, you know, transitions with new technology, we need also that global cooperation. So I think, you know, given that we're here to celebrate the anniversary, 75th anniversary of the UN, it is, I think it, it is an opportunity to say, okay, what sorts of global level institutions, how can you know, say the UN, situate itself to help those dialogues. Because I think the lesson from the pandemic is that in a way, without wanting to sound trite, you know, we are really all in this together. And it has shown gaps in all of the countries in the world. And I think it came up again in the previous panel. It's not just that there are certain countries who have all the answers. Actually, some people are doing things well. So whether that's about the pandemic, whether that's about, you know, climate change. And we need to break down the sorts of barriers that, you know, whether that's around different the geopolitics or whatever, and actually find more constructive ways to listen and learn together. I think that's a real priority because otherwise we're not going to find the solutions to these really big ongoing crises well listen thank you thank you all very much for your contributions and um thank you all uh who uh, endured a, the two hours of a really excellent discussion i mean about as wide ranging a panel as i think i've ever been on that's the nature of the topic uh i just want to say just a couple of things very briefly in closing which first i want to thank all of our hosts including you and a um I want to thank in particular Damien and Rahul who have done so much work to make this possible. Um, we've, we've talked a lot about issues like micro-interventions. We've talked a lot about um, uh, the question of inclusion rather than just policies which are done to people to involve people in designing their own futures, in particular young people. But one thing I just want to leave us with, um, which is a theme that's come up again and again, which is the importance, and it's, it's so relevant to the UN in 75, importance of international cooperation, international regimes, and international organizations. You know, we talked to, at the beginning about the International Convention uh, for Refugees. It's a fragile thing. It needs to be preserved. We talked about multilateral institutions in the economy, the IMF and the World Bank, and changing, uh, changing intellectual frames that they have to, to use. We talked about debt cancellation. Barbara Stocking mentioned uh, the possible need for a pandemic convention. The, the infrastructure of how we all work together across the world has never been more vital and it's never been more fragile. And I think one thing I'd really like to leave us all with today is a sense that uh, investing energy in the regimes and the institutions that bind together underneath the umbrella of the UN is absolutely vital for all the challenges that we've talked about today. So listen, thank you all very much for attending. And uh, we're going to feed back the conclusions of some of the recommendations of this to the workshops at the end. Uh, of the week. Uh, but thank you all again for attending and um, hope to see you again soon. Thank you.